brave the early morning. I know computer people like to sleep in, but uh, my name is Matt Van Winkle. Uh, I work with uh, the group at Rackspace that's responsible for fleet management for our public cloud. Um, and I'm going to talk today a little bit about some of the f interesting things we did to get where we are today. A um, little, little background on this particular presentation. It was a bit of a, a thought experiment. Um, you know, my teams have realized over the last three years that we do very serious work, and that requires us to never take ourselves too seriously. And so um, I try to pepper some of that into this presentation. I, I will give you one disclaimer. Uh, like most of you, I was spent most of last week dealing with Venom. So from my own perspective, there's too many slides and they're too wordy. I would have liked to have you know, more pictures, less words. But the polish you know, didn't quite happen while we were busy running around fixing those things. So most of you know who Rackspace is. We've been around a while. Lots of different hosting options we give customers. Um, and now we run a very large public cloud based on OpenStack. A few specifics about that cloud. Uh, we currently have six regions around the world. Um, Tens of thousands of hosts scattered across them. Um, last count, we're well up in the you know, upper half of 100,000, you know, 100, well over 170,000 instances last time I counted. Um, every region that we run has multiple cells. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, production right now I have is up to, to mid-30s, although I corrected, I looked this morning and forgot that we're actually converting a bunch of our legacy products over to OpenStack. So one of my regions actually has a number of cells up into the mid-50s now. So got to go back and change that. So we're going to talk about today um, the decision to use cells, um, how we run our control plane on a cloud, an OpenStack cloud, um, the fact that we run our computes as a virtualized node on the hypervisor, how we made Neutron work for us, uh, the fact that we manually wire up the vSwitch for all of our instances, I say manually, but uh, on each host we wire them up. And ultimately that we've made the decision to not necessarily find an OpenStack project for everything we're doing. So we'll talk a little bit about all those things. So first of all, cells. Um, this is not nearly as crazy as it used to be by most standards. We're not the only ones using it anymore. Um, CERN and Nectar and I have done a couple presentations on it. This, this summit and the last one, how we use cells. Um, GoDaddy did a great one this, this summit on how they move to cells. Um, it's becoming more and more common. And it is actually upstream, so let's just get that out there now. I get asked that every now and then. It's not upstream, is it? Yes, it's upstream. So why do we use cells? There's a couple main reasons. One is um, it allows us to scale quickly. Um, we can grow these regions very large at a, at a constant, rapid pace. Uh, it does give us some separation of failure domains. So for every cell, there is its own DB, our DB cluster. There's its own rabbit server. So ideally, a failure of one of those things may cause problems in that subset of the fleet, but doesn't necessarily bring down an entire region or cause you problems all over the place. We also offer several different options to our customers of what they can spin up, the type of hardware that's underneath it. And so we actually group these things, common hardware, into cells. So we have multiple cells of different flavor classes. And within those classes, we'll offer different sizes. I used our general purpose uh, as an example. Um, and then also, we have some supply chain constraints. Um, we do leverage Live Migrate in an increasing portion of our fleet. And what we found is it works best when the CPUs match exactly. And so because some of, our, some of our hardware types are multi-source from different vendors, we actually will use cells to, to you know, consolidate all the th stuff from one vendor in a single cell versus a different one from a different vendor um, to keep those things kind of clean. How do we make cells work for us? We typically size our cells. Most of them now are landing just a little over 100 hosts. Um, we have some that go up to 600 hosts on our older hardware profiles. Um, what we've learned over time is this is largely influenced by a layer two failure domain. So we've seen cases in the really large cells where a couple of instances doing bad things or causing like broadcast storms can kind of spiral out of control, especially on an internal network behind the scenes that connects different Rackspace services. Uh, we also find that we're influenced by VM density from the particular flavor classes and how that 
causes us to efficiently carve up our internal IP space. Um, so a lot of those things kind of go into it. But most of our products now, we end up around 100 plus hosts most, most times. Um, it's also some multiple of cabinets once you kind of get to that rough math. Um, and then the number of cabinets that can be in a cell is also somewhat influenced by ports on an agar. So. Um, all that being said, these are not things we expose. Um, a customer doesn't know what cell they're in, um, nor that will they probably ever. Uh, it's just more of a way that we can manage the fleet as it grows. It's not perfect. Um, it's getting better. There are still some upstream issues. Um, the gate is currently working, I believe, but not voting yet. Um, it's going to be soon. Um, there is a sense of duplicate data. The implementation of cells today takes everything in every cell database and copies it to the global database or the region level, top level database. Um, so you kind of have this duplication of data. Um, there is no easy upgrade path at the moment to, what I'd, to what's coming down the road. Uh, cells V2, we'll, we'll mention that in a second. Um, and not every patch that comes down the pipe is necessarily thought, thinks about cells. We do find that sometimes like, Different features or different patches will come in and we have to go figure out, can they be made to work with cells? Uh, or there's an interesting conversation that begins to happen on the spec between you know, Tim Bell over at CERN and whoever submitted it about, hey, why didn't you think about cells? And where that goes. Um, and one of my fundamental problems with it is I can't turn one off. Um, and there are times, as you all know, when things break in portions of your infrastructure and to be able to not send builds to that would be amazing. So the code on the right side is actually a really dirty hack that I shared with our other, the, in the sales presentation of how we apply a filter with a custom weight and that allows scheduler to not send any builds whatsoever. So it's the closest thing we have to an off switch for ourselves. Cells V2 is coming though. Um, we were in several design sessions yesterday about this. Here's the short version. So in Liberty, I, the devs are trying to get to the point where everyone will have cells that doesn't today except you'll just have one. It'll, it'll, essentially just be a framework that's sitting underneath um, Nova. And then in the M release, the target is you have the full thing. You can take that framework, you can begin to expand it uh, if you so choose to multiple cells. And those of us who've been running V1 to now um, have to figure out how to do the upgrade path to the new version. Some of the things you're looking at doing are trimming down that global database to only retain the information you need to associate instances with their underlying cells and allow more direct communication from the APIs down to the child cells. Today, there's a, multi, there's a double layer of RPC calls going on between multiple rabbits and a service called cells, which augments the scheduler. So the next thing is we run, we run all of our control plane. We run our cloud by, with instances on a cloud. Again, this is less crazy than it was originally. Um, there are several people who do this in, in various forms. Triple O is out there, which uh, talks about the same thing. Um, I found this picture from the San Diego summit in the fall of 2012, uh, where Troy Toman was up on stage talking about several things. And this, I thought he had had a, a great diagram of it. He didn't. So this screenshot is actually from the time in the talk he was going over this. But um, so we built a small um, OpenStack deployment, small by compared to our public cloud in every one of our data centers, and in that we spawn instances that represent our APIs, our databases, our rabbit nodes. Um, pretty much everything we need to run OpenStack. Uh, um, yeah. One thing I will add is we do have cells in our, we have cells inside of our small OpenStack deployments. That's for two reasons. One, we have started to introduce multiple hardware types there too, so we gave our customers performant hardware, we're like, hey, let's do the same thing for our control plane. Uh, also, we have, over time, allowed other groups at Rackspace to, to use that same capacity for internal projects, um, and so we like to separate the tenants so that we know certain parts of that are only for our instances to run the control plane for the cloud, and then the other folks have their space. Here's a relatively accurate picture of how things are today that I pulled off one of our, our wiki pages. Um, we essentially manually configure a small number of hosts with, we set VMs up on it, but we do it manually. Those VMs become, if you will, the control plane for the small cloud. 
Um, typically, we have one that represents kind of the global API level, one that represents Glance for this deployment, and then some number of them that will represent the various cells underneath. And at that point, it looks just like any other OpenStack installation with cells. We have a bunch of cabinets out there that are organized in the cells running their computes. On those computes, we spawn instances, which in turn become API nodes, rabbit nodes, et cetera, that run all the many, many hypervisors out in the production fleet. So it's good. It's easier to automate um, the distribution of nodes, tearing them down, spinning them up, moving them about reacting to problems. Uh, one of the real common ones that we've, we've benefited from this is if something breaks in a way that causes the rabbit queue to spike out of control, then we can just go spin up a whole bunch of global sales workers until it pulls them down and then tear them right back down. So it's an easy way to react to some of those problems. Um, it gives us a little more insight into the customer experience because we're essentially running our own software on ourselves. And so, you know, if there's a problem that's hurting us that bad, there's a chance that it's, it's affecting our customers. Um, there's a little bad to it. Um, it exposes us to any bugs that come down the pipe as well. So our control plane now is susceptible to any problems you know, in Nova that might cause issues. Um, it's more clouds, if you will, to maintain. So you know, now I've got two clouds in every physical region, not one. Um, and it's reminding us that we're still kind of, we still think like systems folks. Like when it comes to HA and those things, we still kind of try to do the stuff you used to do when you had a couple cabinets of gear and you wanted to cross connect them and, and make a pair. And it's, it's stretching us a little bit to, to think more like a web app developer. Like I know this is infrastructure, but how do we deploy it like a web app? How do we treat it like a web app? And we're still, <clears throat> excuse me, still learning that. There's a few really ugly parts. So we do share it with other groups, like I said, and so there's some capacity wars there. Um, you know, people want more and more and more, and we're trying to build more and more control planes. And unfortunately, unlike the public cloud where people are buying it and paying us money and our finance department is happy to just keep pouring gear into it, um, it's a little bit harder to go say, now I need a quarter million dollars to expand this thing that's not gonna make us any money. So that's a challenge. Um, and then we right now do have some version drift from our software perspective. Um, there's some features that we're waiting to convert uh, for the purposes of our internal cloud that has us a few revisions of our own software behind the public cloud. So that's probably the biggest challenge we're facing right now. Where are we going with it? So this does open the door to, to uh, containers. Can we use containers more easily for some of our control plane? Um, what are different ways we can think about clustering? Going back to, if we, if we treat this like a web app, what would we do differently? And um, where can we stop thinking about pushing code to a node and think more about fleet management? So APIs, for example. Uh, instead of updating the code on the APIs, why are we not just spinning up new ones, adding them to a load balancer, dropping out the old ones? Things like that that we can spend more time digging into. So that brings us to the next one, which is that we run the actual Nova compute as a VM. This is actually something that, let me back up. Using Zen Server is kind of an exception in the community. We're one of the very few people who do it, um, which adds its challenges. Most folks are developing for libvirt. We use Zappy. However, using Zappy allows it to, it handles being remotely managed much better than libvirt. And so essentially that allowed us to take all the compute code stick it in a VM that we manually create on our hypervisors and have it externally manage Zappy, if you will, for all the tenant creation, deletion, and, and management. So it, it's a little wacky. It effectively doubled my node count, if you think about fleet management. So now if I have 5,000 hosts in a region, I also have 5,000 computes. And they're distinctly different things. So, however, it gives me some flexibility, right? So if I need to reboot my compute node, that doesn't affect the underlying instances on the host. Worst case, if I need to blow the compute node up and start over, it may affect being able to send instructions or commands or reboots or whatever to that instance, but it doesn't actually affect the instance. Conversely, it gives me a little bit, it's not perfect, but it gives me a little bit of isolation of the compute from the hypervisor um, from a security perspective. 
The biggest place where that helps me is we have a bunch of great support people who sit on the other ends of phones and tickets and chats helping customers. Some of them do have privileges that allow them to log into our hosts because, as you all know, sometimes a migration goes bad or you know, an instance get it, gets in a state that only a human can unstick. And so in order to do that, they have to log in. So this allows me to grant people the ability to log into my host, but they're not necessarily getting into the compute node that has credentials to my database and access to the other parts of my, my infrastructure. Um, it's also got us thinking about maybe crazier ways we can do this in the future. So um, one of them is, can we use containers for it? Might be good. Could we extract the compute node from the host itself? A little bit wackier, but you know, when you start thinking about pushing code, right, and you have to touch seven, eight, nine thousand things with that code, what if you could cut that by a factor of ten, right? What if I could pull my compute nodes out, run them as instances in my internal cloud, and have each one manage ten hosts? Now, there's a lot of upstream things that would have to happen for that to work, but that's the kind of stuff we're thinking about. Like, if we maintain this separation, can we go a step further? Um, ultimately, could we have a small number of compute nodes sharing a bunch of hosts so you even have some, some redundancy built in? We're watching the work we're doing right now with our on-metal offering. Um, so Ironic basically does this in, in a very simplified uh, form, or simplified answer. It kind of does this already. So what are we learning from that? Can we extrapolate it to what we're doing um, on this side? All right, Neutron. This one always gets interesting. Um, we do use Neutron, and we use Neutron with cells. Um, and the way we did that was we built a plugin. Uh, this actually allowed us to do a lot more than just use cells, but why did we build a plugin? So when Neutron first started, we looked at all the things we needed the network to do for us, or we needed the network stuff, if you will, to do for us. Um, we had to assign IPs to an instance, but we actually needed to assign it on multiple networks. So out of the box, every instance in our cloud gets two networks one for the internet and one for other services at Rackspace. Um, we also will assign the MAC addresses to the instances as they're created. So we keep a pool of MACs that we allocate out. Um, we also want to support, and since we've launched this cloud, or shortly after we launched this cloud, we have supported overlay or software-defined networks between instances in the cloud. So you could spin up two are several instances all over, say, our DFW cloud, and build a private network between them. So whatever we did had to still interface with an upstream controller to work with that. And ultimately, this goes back to the choices we made before, all this has to work with Zen Server. And even with ML2, there are a few things today that don't work well with Zen Server. So we built Quark. Um, Quark is readily available. It is a full-fledged plugin for Neutron. Um, the name came from the concept of it being neutron light and sort of the, you know, a neutron contains quarks. Um, it essentially allows us to run the neutron API and all those things, but then uh, we can manage our needs by this plugin. Uh, it does allow us to, to also use vendor uh, plugins. So, for example, we have NICERA controllers that help us run our software defined networks and our overlay networks um, within the cloud. Um, we're running both bridged and tunnel networks. So when you get your public IP address on an instance in our cloud, it is allowed, I mean, you're not going through a NAT or any kind of thing. You're, you have a public IP address that's routed out to the internet. Um, we can talk of later if that's good or bad, but that's what it is, uh, along with the tunnel networks that help support SDN and all those things. Um, and it does support cells, and we'll talk a little bit more detail about that in just a second. How do we do the IPAM with it? Um, essentially, when we started, there wasn't an upstream a concrete API for IPAM. It was very dependent on vendor. Um, in some cases, you still got it, but not always. I will say, in fairness, that's being a pluggable IPAM is being worked upstream, so um, full disclosure, they're fixing it. Um, Quark, however, the way we do this is we create two, create two ports per instance. We add a, an IP to each. Uh, and we allocate the MAC. And then there's kind of a rough drawing of, of that network set up. Um, instance on the host is attached to both networks. Maybe? 
Here we go. So how does it support, allow us to use cells? Um, and I probably should have changed this. One of my engineers called me out elsewhere. It shouldn't be support. It's probably awareness more than is a better word. But uh, with Quark, we basically added a column to the database that represents a segment, right? So um, we had a conversation yesterday with the large deployments team that, you know, we all kind of agreed, like, the real problem here with Neutron isn't so much about cells, but about not being aware of network topology. And so the way we've solved it is we've got this column that allows, adds a segment. So we define a tenant for each cell. Each cell becomes a segment. The provider subnets, the public and the internal network, are scoped to that segment. And then when Nova requests its information, it just selects the available, from the available IPs on those segments, on the networks for those segments. Um, so works pretty well. I invite you to definitely go back and check out uh, the GitHub. Take a look at it. If it can help you solve some of your problems of moving to Neutron, all the better. All right. On top of our own plugin for Neutron, we went through a lot of pain and struggle to sort of end up at a point where we decided it was better for us to effectively wire our own vSwitches than allow a controller to do it. Um, let's talk a little bit about why. So when we started the public cloud, or shortly thereafter, when we introduced software-defined networking, our controllers were doing everything. An instance would spin up, and the controller would give it a public IP address. It would give it its internal private IP address. It would allow for software-defined networking. It would manage all the ports. It would do all the things. It was great. And that worked pretty well up through the first few hundred hosts per region. Um, then we started running into some weird problems. Uh, for one, we would actually grow faster than the product could support the number of ports we needed. So we re reached these really interesting times when we were watching the capacity counter click closer and closer to 100, and we physically could not add more, more servers until we could upgrade our controllers. So we were back and forth with the vendor. Hey, we need the upgrade. Oh, you were testing. You know. So there was a few of those rounds of tense moments. The upgrades themselves were impactful, meaning that the process of upgrading the controllers would actually introduce data path disruption, hopefully for a brief period of time. But it's still this odd overlap of, here you are upgrading a control plane item, and you're introducing data path interruption. And that's kind of the whole reason you run clouds, is to not do that, right? You can. Um, and then, unfortunately, several of those upgrades went bad. <laughs> and what was going to be a long night anyways turned into a long morning. Um, and in general, any time the cluster had a failure, so whatever, however many nodes it was, any time one of them would fail, we would see the time that it took to sync that much data between the other ones on the order of two, three hours, right? It was slow. And on top of that, we had no real insight into where it was in the sync process or any idea who was actually affected at that time. So some number of instances we knew were without flows at the moment. All their flows had been dropped. But I couldn't go tell you, well, it's these over here and not these over here. And the best guess we had was when all of our own IRC bouncers started coming back up, we knew we were making progress, right? That's just not a where, where you want to be as a service provider. Um, so very clearly, we had to do something different. And we actually went back to a model we used with our legacy product, where we did wire up the vSwitch. Now, it wasn't as complicated back then. We didn't do as many things with the instances. But we did wire up our own vSwitches back then. So we said, OK, let's do it again. And that's what we did. So right now, we run a set of scripts on every host that are involved in the process of provisioning an instance. Um, it, gets the, it gets the information it needs from Neutron. It gets the information it needs from our controllers. But essentially, it plugs the vSwitch. It plugs everything into the vSwitch as the instance comes up. So, and it's scaled much nicer. It's not perfect, but it's scaled much nicer. The controllers now handle the software-defined networking, the thing they're really good at. And from time to time, they still have issues, and there is impact, but that impact is restricted to the people using the software-defined networks, and usually the recovery time is much faster because the amount of data that has to get resynced across the remaining nodes is much smaller. There's a few caveats to it. Um, so because I said we have multiple flavor types, and we have multiple vendors within those flavor types, and in some cases we have slight variations from the same vendor and the same model of computer that we bought six months ago from now, We've had to sort of figure out every one of those cases as we've gone along. 
one of our engineers, Andy, is sitting over there, he could probably tell you in much more painful detail some of those, those gotchas. Um, this also adds an extra step. If for some reason you have to restart the vSwitch, you'd lose your flows. So there's some extra things we have to do to make sure that it effectively reruns that script on the instance um, to regenerate the flows. Um, from my perspective, if I think about fleet management generically and all the different bits that I want to validate on a particular host as far as if they're in the right version or not, this is one more thing, right? So now I've got the version of Zen server that's running, the, which patches are on it, what, you know, what state the compute node is in, what version of the code's in the compute node, what version of OVS am I running, and oh, by the way, do I have the latest network scripts too, right? So it's just one more thing to sort of audit against on a host. And it has definitely uncovered the edgiest of edge cases that I've seen. Um, I'll tell you a specific story. We had a case about a year and a half ago where randomly on a Friday night about a bunch of hosts in one of our small regions just started spontaneously rebooting. We're like, okay, not cool. So through the process of troubleshooting over the weekend, we had actually isolated everything down to about three instances in the entire region that would if soon as they tried to access their CBS volume, would crash the host. Still weren't quite sure why. What we found out was a bug in our network scripts had uncovered a bug in Zen server. And basically what had happened is we had gotten these, the hosts in this, this particular cell at two different shipments. And there was a subtle difference in the way that vSwitch was wired in one versus the other because of where we were in our evolution of things at the time. And we just hadn't caught that. Um, and somehow, the, if you had the, the wrong wiring on the new host, it was effectively putting some traffic on the wrong virtual interface. That's not great. It's not the end of the world. However, the bug in Zen server did not react well to that traffic being on the wrong interface, and that's what crashed the host. So, you know, here we're talking about, at that point in time, we were running probably roughly about 2,000 to, 2, to 2,500 instances in that region. So you're talking literally about a 1 in 1,000 problem that caused larger downstream effects. And that's just one of sort of the edge cases we found with this. So it's a great solution, but it has been um, tricky to get to. I will say that in talking with a couple of the developers, we're working on a floating IP solution, and their hope is that once that's done, we can spend a little bit of time trying to push some of this network script stuff up and out and, and let other people take a look at it. So and I can't promise a date, but I know people are thinking about it. So hopefully at some point in the future, Cork will be out there, these will be out there. If anyone's crazy enough to try both of them, you can join us in the madness, right? All right. Talk a little bit about some of the places where we don't use OpenStack projects um, on purpose. Um, we definitely love OpenStack for what it, its core functions are, you know, to build clouds. So compute resources, storage resources, network resources, all those things. The reason we got involved in this is because we wanted help to build really good software to do that. What we find is a lot of the other things, and, and there's plenty of projects that get submitted every day to StackForge and other places, and there's lots of conversations on the mailing list about, hey, I've got this thing I want to do in OpenStack that does this kind of monitoring or this kind of whatever. And those are great, but there's also a lot of open source stuff that's already out there that is well formed and good to go. And so what we've decided to do is when it comes to a lot of the fleet management components and sort of the everyday stuff, let's grab what's off the shelf and let's focus our OpenStack uh, expertise on those core components that really matter. Uh, and in other areas, we just went out and built something. And someday we may push it up or we may clean it up and hand it to other folks, but there were spots where we were like, no, we just want to go build a quick, dirty little service to do this thing. So one concrete example where we've purposely made a choice um, is we just haven't, and it's not, a, not an offense to the Salometer folks, we just found that we didn't need to go down that road. Um, the main thing we would use something like Salometer for is validating usages. So we bill customers for the time that they use their instance and the amount of bandwidth they use. And honestly, StackTag does that for us. It, it validates that we've collected all the usages and we've sent them downstream, and then when there's a problem, it alerts us and we go fix it. Um, it also is a great source of data if I'm trying to troubleshoot a specific instance and what it's gone through. So I did pull up, I just went in randomly and grabbed one of the, the regions and happened to see where it was logging the start and stop of a instance or image creation, so. Um. 
Uh, there was a really good thread, like last week, I think it was, about CMDBs on the operator thread. Um, and I was debating heavily how I wanted to wade into that. I didn't get a chance to because of the other shenanigans. But, you know, we, we realized early on that we needed a solid inventory management. Um, and it had to be really, really custom to us and how we do things. Uh, the reason why is, on one hand, our infrastructure is treated as a very large managed hosting customer at Rackspace, right? I mean, Rackspace started by taking physical boxes and sticking them in a data center and leasing them to customers. And so there's all these systems and tooling inside the company designed to track and manage physical hosts in a data center that all of our you know, thousands of machines are in. And we need a lot of that data to run the cloud. We also have two sets of Nova databases we need data out of. We have our production Nova databases. So we want all the compute node data, what's on, what's off, what's going on with those. And then we have this other database that goes along with that internal cloud I talked about that we want a lot of tenant information out of, right? Because now all the, all the control plane stuff's tenants in that database. So how do I know which ones I care about, what I want to know about them? How do I pull that out? So those are kind of the key data sources. There's also, you know, just like everywhere else, some of the data we really cared about was in wiki pages, and some of it was in people's heads, right? And it's just meta information that had nowhere else to live. And so out of that was born an effort that we call Galaxy. And it's not, it's not even a data source as much as it's a data aggregator. It goes out and, on a regular basis, harvests the things we care about out of all these other systems, puts it in one place with a bunch of key value pairs, sticks a fr an API on the front end of it, and then allows us to go write all of our tooling to just query that. Say, tell me everything I need to know about this host or this cell. Um, I took a screenshot and sanitized a little bit, but you kind of get an idea of some of the data that's easily presentable with this. Um, you're looking at a portion of our Performance One, we call it hardware, in our Chicago data center. Um, had to hide the host and all that, but you can see there, it shows you the host, it shows you the cab count, and in the case of that one, there's five cabinets. If I clicked on that link, it would actually show me the list of cabinets. I could go down to a list of hosts. I could see which hosts were not only in, had Zen server installed and were ready to go, but also who had a compute, who didn't, who's disabled, who's not disabled. Um, just a real quick way to sort of see how stuff's going on in the fleet. We also started building some microservices to go along with this. We started with one called Resolver. Um, it does just that. It's a real simple service. We, you know, we looked at our ops guys and we looked at the flood of alerts coming at them from tens of thousands of hosts every day. And we realized that 30% you know, of them are I have to just log in and restart this thing or I have to just do this simple little repeatable task. So let's stop having them have to worry about that. So Resolver was born to do that. We've since uh, expanded it to take any kind of messages. So now we can drop things on a rabbit queue and Resolver can react to it just like it could a, a monitoring alert. Um, and then after that, we built another service called Auditor. It does what it says it's supposed to do. It goes out and given a set of rules, looks at the fleet and says, who doesn't follow the rules? And so what this shot is, is actually we deployed about four or five weeks ago. Um, I'm sorry, this is a, this is what I want to talk about. Um, we deployed four or five weeks ago uh, a mechanism where auditor will detect a compute node that's not the right version. Because let's face it, if you have five or 6,000 of these in one data center, there's a really good chance one of them doesn't have the right code on it, right? Either it was down when you deployed or, you know, whatever. Um, and so auditor is constantly crawling through the, to the, through the environment, determining which ones are out of sync, and then it just drops a little message on the queue to resolver who goes out and runs a playbook that updates the code. So that's kind of the first, like, this is all brand new stuff. This is... Um, I know everyone's going to come back and say, when can I have it? And we'll figure that out. But like, this is all stuff we've, we've just kind of really started diving into. Um, so where do we go from here? Um, what are the next sort of crazy things? Like, what are, these are the conversations we're having based on all the stuff we just talked about. Like, what can we do? And we're talking about things like, from the time a cabinet rolls in the data center and gets plugged in, can I get it from that state to taking customer instances without a person touching it? And the reality is we have all the pieces already built. It's literally just stitching them together at this point. And so that's one of the things we're talking about. Um, more self-healing. What are the other things? You know, I mentioned earlier that when I think about a host, 
in its own, there's six or seven items I care about, the version of, the state of, all those things. You know, can I have more jobs out there auditing all those things, patch levels, um, those kinds of things. Or, if Live Migrate's a thing, do I just shoot first and ask questions later? Like, you know, should, a, should an operations person ever have to log into a host if it's not on all the current versions, right? Probably not. If it doesn't have all the current versions of all the things, move everyone off, shoot it in the head, start over, test it, make sure it's good, pat it on the butt, put it back into production, right? If it is on all the right things and it's still doing something weird, okay, let someone look at that, right? That's something we care about, because there's a problem we don't know. Let's go find that out. Um, we want more live migrates. Uh, we actually have orchestration built that'll move everything around in the cell. So let's start thinking about future security patches, right? If we have the time, can we put the patch down and then sort of start to play the, you know, the shell game as we move everyone off of a host, patch and reboot it, move everyone else around? Um, what we're finding, at least when, in our environment with Live Migrate, is there's a little bit of I.O. blocking, right, because you're copying. This is, by the way, this is without attached storage. So there's a little bit of I.O. blocking as it copies data between two hosts. And the network scripts have been updated, so the packet loss on the actual switchover is like three to seven packets. So in 99.99% of the cases, this instance will freeze for a second, and then it comes back. TCP session, like you can be logged in, and it'll move, and you're fine. You, like I said, it'll freeze for a second, and then come back. Now, that does not work across my entire fleet, so don't think that I'm out there like mad scientists moving everyone around just yet. We have a lot of other work to do to upgrade to support that, but this is the kind of stuff we're thinking about. And then the one I like to joke about is, like, I have all these tools that react to alerts, and I'm building all this monitoring around capacity and utilization and all that kind of stuff. And I have this system that I have to log into every now and then and submit a request for more gear that finance already has approved and has a plan for, but I still have to submit the request. So why can't the cloud order its own gear? Like, that's just another kind of level of like, weird thinking that we have is, like, we're building all this stuff, and it knows what's going on. Let's just, it's got an API to that system. Let's just have the, you know, DFW order its own cabinets. And if they want to approve it or not, that's a finance decision, but you know, the cloud can at least say, hey, I need more. So that's just a few of the things that, that we're sort of starting to think about based on all the things that we've already done. So I think I have like four minutes left, so I will take any questions, ideally from the microphone, but I'll try to repeat them if you don't go there. This may be a dumb question, mm -hmm. but could you describe a bit what a cell is? Sure. It's a new concept to me. Yeah, yeah, no, no yeah, we, <laughs> happily. Um, think about it this way. A cell should, should be thought of as an internal construct that you as an operator use to organize your fleet, all right? And you may choose to do that based on hardware type. Um, I don't think Sam's in here. Um, Nectar, for example, actually has a different cell in each geography because of the way that their particular cloud is funded. And locations get their own funding. And so what they've done is they've collected hosts in a region based on what, what the source of funding was, but they have one API over all of it. So, you know, different reasons like that. Um, like I said, it does offer you some separation of failure domain and, in a sense, horizontal scaling of your database and your rabbits and all that. If you just kept piling rabbits for, or nodes, for example, onto one rabbit server, it could get overloaded at some point, right? Um, so that's really kind of the, the, the core of it. What you do beyond that is really kind of starts getting down into operator preference. Um, and if you, if you talk to the different groups that use cells, we all actually do things slightly different and for different reasons. Um, some people will group cells based on when they bought the hardware, but then they have host aggregates that span multiple cells based on the hardware type. Like I said, we'll actually not only get the same hardware profile, but the same vendor and put them in a cell. And then we'll grow them like also based on what the ports on our aggregation routers allow us to do. So there's only so many ports on every router pair. So I know that each, each cell will have X number of cabinets. The router pair will support you know, so many cells and I, I can plan sort of my growth that way. Does that help? Um, do you use local storage for your instances, and why or why not? Uh, so most of them, yes. Um, we do have 
boot from volume, both in our, our general purpose and high I.O. offerings that can also do local storage, and we have compute and memory optimized flavors that are only boot from volume. Mm -hmm. um, why? That's just how we started. Um, and the boot from volume options are only a few months old. So we do actually have the conversations with respect to live migrate and a lot of other things and, and customer experience. You know, is moving towards a volume-based only model a better way to go? But that implies a lot of costs and customer change. Um, but it was just the way we did in our legacy product. And when we first jumped over to use OpenStack, we just kind of built the same thing. Uh, and in a lot of cases, it works great for people. And, and, and most of our hardware now that we're ordering that is local volume storage is at least SSD back. So it's still fast and, and does those things. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think maybe one more and then we so in the paradigm of service and tenant cloud that you started going towards, so you have this cloud, you know, all your controllers and VMs. Mm -hmm. uh, could you talk about the management of the service cloud, the stability of that, or do you ever worry about that, the riskiness of that? And second is the HA of the service VMs now within that context, you know? So so we worry a little bit about scheduling and all that. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've solved most of our scheduling worries by isolating capacity to ourselves. So we know we have this capacity. It's for our control plane items. Um, it's away from other internal users. And honestly, if the API for our internal cloud went down, it's not the end of the world because we're not constantly scheduling new instances. From an HA perspective, the one place where we do HA right now is our databases. It's not the best solution. It's a, it's a dual database master pair using DRBD and CoroSync. Uh, and if one of them goes down, it basically, the other one will fence it. It'll go into the API and shut it down until we know what's going on. And then we sync to some slaves for, for backups and those kinds of things. We are looking at Galera and all the other things. It's just you know, one of those trade-offs where you, know, you only have so many fires and so many new things to do. And so that is on our, our roadmap of a better way to do the database clustering. But that's probably the main place where we cluster. Um, I'll be honest, our Rabbit server is, version is old, and we need to look at a newer version and kind of understand what we want to do from a clustering standpoint there. But we have been listening to a lot of the people talking about how that's still not ideal. Like, it's not perfect, right? So, um, yeah. I think for us, it's going to be a matter of can we cluster the global Rabbit and kind of deal with the cell Rabbits being single nodes? Because there's less things to clean up if a cell Rabbit falls over. But if the global rabbit falls over, it's not a fun day. It, it takes a while to sort of sort that out. So cool. I think that's the time. If you have any questions, let me know afterwards. But thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs>